Silver and gold prices were beaten down for most of the week, with the sharpest sell-offs occurring yesterday, Thursday, around 8.30 a.m. morning Eastern Time. The spot price for silver is closing the week around $15.20 an ounce, while gold spot price is closing around $1,294 fiat U.S. dollars per troy ounce. The palladium spot price saw a massive sell-off, dropping nearly $200 U.S. dollars per troy ounce this week. Palladium appears to be closing around 1,388 fiat Federal Reserve notes per troy ounce. Not much has changed fundamentally for dwindled tight palladium supply levels, so it'll be interesting to see how long it takes for palladium to retrace the spot price losses we witnessed this week. Platinum again remains floundering around the $850 price range, close to where it ended last week, still hovering around its cheapest price level to gold in over 110 years of time. Moving on to this week's guests of the show, it's been almost a full year since we last spoke with Jim Willie, author of the Hat Trick Letter and purveyor of golden-jackass.com. Silver Doctor's own Paul Halfdollar Eberhardt spoke with Jim at length today. We'll break this discussion down into two parts. Be sure to subscribe and click the alert button on the Silver Doctor's YouTube channel to be alerted when part two goes live early next week. Part one with Jim Willie is coming up following this brief message from our show's sponsor. For a limited time, the Austrian Mint and SD Bullion are offering you a Silver Philharmonic Buy 19 Get One Free Coin deal. Officially issued by this storied 825 year old European Bullion Mint. These famous European Silver Bullion products come packaged complete in protective sealed Austrian Mint tubes containing 20 coins apiece or in bulk sealed Austrian mint cases containing 500 troy ounces in each. These guaranteed one troy ounce Austrian Philharmonics are official European legal tender silver coins. Each is comprised with a minimum 0.999 fine silver bullion content. Austrian Philharmonic bullion coins qualify for silver IRAs, making them an excellent choice for tax deferred, long-term bullion savings. Discreetly shipped, fully insured to SD Bullion customers' doors and non-bank faults. Don't delay. This free silver Austrian Philharmonic Bullion coin deal will end soon. Welcome, gold and silver investors, patriots, preppers, other smart individuals. Today is Friday, March 29th. 2019. This is Metals and Markets. My name is Half Dollar. I will be your host for today's show. Today's guest is a returning guest. He needs no introduction other than the fact that his website just got an upgrade. Jim Willie, the golden jackass himself, and the website is now golden hyphen jackass. Is that correct, Jim? Yes, it is. And let me just give you a quick update. Um, for the last few years, there's been just... I don't know how to describe it except an explosion of handheld device usage. Um, I had a client provide me information, oh gosh, late last year and said, Jim, you want to take a guess? At least in Europe, there was a big poll. How much website access was done with handheld devices? And what was the figure five years ago? I said, well, I'm thinking five years ago was maybe 15, 20%. Now it's maybe 40%. He said, no, before it was 40%. Now it's 65. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the majority is from here. Anyway, the golden hyphen jackass is now very friendly to handheld devices. And it has a wider format. And I just think it's an overall tremendous upgrade. Um, so that's uh, the basis of the new website. And it's a, a fellow in Western Europe who's uh, the manager, and he's a software engineer and um, search, oh gosh, I don't even know what to call it, search technician, marketing analyst. He's a very sharp fellow. Mm -hmm. So that aside, uh, you know, here we are. It, it has been, I would guess, about six years since we've had, five or six years since we've been involved in this pretty enduring painful gold market correction and uh, you know there might be some Elliott wave uh, fanatics out there I don't like I don't disparage them at all uh, there's a lot of legitimacy to it when you when you break into new ground 
Mm. Like, uh, I would just say an internet stock like Amazon uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. There's no previous history. So what governs the big movements in sequence with waves and corrections and big, gra- big gains? Elliott Wave seems to govern that very well. Mm. I think we've been involved in a five, six year um, Elliott fourth wave correction. And they don't get big signals with banners and trumpets that it's all ending. We're getting ready to do a, another nice big move up. So what you do, what you have to do is you have to look for the dollar signals. And, and that's what I do uh, for the last two years. It's been really since the Ukraine war. Ukraine war was a seminal event. That was a major broadcast to the world. Mm-hmm. Well, our world, planet Earth. Um that the United States has no interest in the global community at all, only in more hegemony, parasitic, fraudulent activity to defend their system. And, and, you know, very little known, Paul, I'm sorry, half dollar, I'm sorry, half dollar, reminds me of the guy named 50 Cent. (laughs) He's a a black actor. He's a lot of fun. He is. He um, is. That's right. Although those are just copper pennies when you add up 50 cents. <laughs> okay, 50 f- copper pennies. You're a half dollar. Okay. That's right. That's 90%, Jim. There, there's a, a factor that's not well known. Preliminary by a month or two to the Ukraine war. And that was the United States uh, was a signatory on something like a hundred nation accord for the global financial reset, to move away from the the dollar as a global currency reserve, move away from trade payment being exclusively in treasury bills, move away from the dollar and the treasury bond being the, the global currency reserve and banking system, and just move toward, move away from the dollar, move toward the gold standard in various agreed upon steps. Okay. And the United States violated the agreement, which was not well publicized. The agreement wasn't publicized, and nor was the, uh, what's the word, cancellation, expunging, um, violation of this agreement. Because the United States, with the help of Israel, uh, created the, the Ukraine war. They did the Maidan massacre, the Maidan uprising. They passed out a thousand vials of methamphetamine in the square and had police on the rooftops killing people in order to create the chaos. That was done by the Langley boys and the security agency, beginning with an M, out of that little nation in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean, whose name I really don't care to mention much, because they're behind the death threats that I received in 2006. Okay, so there's big resistance, and there has been for months and years, for the reset. And and if you're confused about what the reset is, just think of it as reform of the global monetary system and financial structures away from the dollar, which has no backing, which has no sound basis, and a movement towards something that's sound, according to to say, some people, and and me included, would say is the Austrian School of Economics uh, teachings and dictums and pronouncements and rules and guidelines for sound money. We don't have sound money and therefore we're having a colossal suffocation globally of debt. And oh gosh, I have to I have to mention the debt from the United States. Okay, now you may not like this comment, but it's it's my reality. I have a lifelong problem of tickly nose and allergies. Um, I, 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 I'm, I go like this a lot, and some idiots say, oh, Jim, you got a cocaine problem. No, you idiot. I've got an allergy problem and a tickly nose. Can you deal with it? So, you know, pardon me. When I talk a lot, my nose moves, <laughs> and I get a tickly nose. Okay. Not a problem. The trolls lash out at me with every article that I write as well, Jim. Okay. All right. There's a sequence in progress. It's powerful. It has many sides. It's all non-dollar. But let me offer a preface of the U.S. government 
and the na national finances. Okay. Um, we just had a an announcement of recent U.S. government deficit, and it's really jumped, uh, and it's for five months. So if you extrapolate, and for people who don't know what that means, you take five months, you take the average of that, and you multiply by 12. Okay, it's not very complicated. It's just a forward movement. If we're on this trajectory, where are we looking, where do we sit at 12 months? We're sitting at $1.3 trillion in deficit. So we'll be moving from 22 to 23 and a half trillion. Okay. There's an impression around the world that they'll never be paid back on their treasury bonds. That's why they're dumping the treasuries. And they're also noticing that the Wall Street banks are committing unspeakable fraud with the treasuries. And they're also noticing that the U.S. government is paying for its deficit by printing money, which is what African and South American countries have done with disastrous results. All right. So we've got a deficit that is not being managed. Now, remember, Trump came in 2016 with a campaign promise to re redo, rework, reset U.S. industrial base. That is a gigantic campaign promise broken. His first act, indeed, was to increase the military budget by $130 billion after promising to reduce it. So we know who controls the Trump presidency. It's Wall Street and the Pentagon, along with that little nation in the southeast corner of the Mediterranean, whose agent, Jared Kushner, is not a good guy. Okay, so that's the deficit. How about the trade debt, the trade gap? Okay. Widening, isn't it, Jim? It, it's, getting, it's getting horrendous. It, it's, it's not just widening, it's accelerating. Okay. It's, it's expanding beyond people's estimations, including my own. And I have a pretty good track record of estimating. Okay, two years ago, a year and a half, you know, they will operate on a fiscal year that ends in September. We had a $650 billion trade gap. Okay, and then suddenly there's new numbers that it's 700 last year or 720. Now we're on track for $920 billion. Now let me give people an idea of the consequence of such a gigantic, unresolvable trade gap because we've not reworked and rebuilt our industry. We still enjoy the offshoring benefits. Okay, this is microeconomics destroying macroeconomics. Let me explain that quickly. Many companies, like, like just say General Motors and Ford, they have truck assembly plants in Mexico. That reduces the cost. They can sell in the U.S. market for a lower cost. But they, they uh, cut out what they call it. They uh, cut jobs. They cut thousands of jobs for the United Auto Workers, and there's lots of layoffs, and there's lots of uh, you know uh, un uh, unemployment insurance benefits, and they run out after 99 weeks. Then we call them employed after they run out. It's just it's sickening our economic statistics. Okay, so it might have been good for Ford and General Motors to lower their cost structure, but it was a wrecking ball to the U.S. economy. Now do that for, say, several hundred companies, multinationals, and your microeconomic benefits have destroyed the country by increasing its trade deficit. Let me put the trade deficit in perspective for you. At a $1,300 gold price, if we had a $650 billion trade deficit, that would require under the circumstances of a gold-backed currency, the dollar, a mm. new gold-backed currency, would say, you know, thousands of tons of gold backing it up. I mean, real gold in vaults <clears throat> that make noise when you stack them. <clears throat> the $650 billion would translate to 13,000 tons of gold forfeited. The U.S. doesn't it's, have 13,000 tons of gold last time I checked, Jim. No, no. Well, we have zero. Um, remember, I said, if we have a gold-backed new dollar, if we have, then the trade debt from two years ago, a year and a half ago, would require the forfeiture of 13,000 tons of gold in the first year. 
And some people say, oh, Jim, but you don't understand the gold price can rise. I said, yeah, I do. I'm a mathematician. If they double the gold price, that means in two years we lose 13,000 tons of gold. Okay, now, increase it by 50%. <laughs> We've gone from 650 to 920. It's not quite 50%. That means if the gold price stays where it is at 1300, in the first year we will forfeit 19,000 tons of gold. Hmm. We're working in the wrong direction, and Trump might be recovering the stolen Fort Knox gold by. It was done by Reuben, Clinton, Papa Bush, Wall Street. Langley and the new president in the White House, Clinton. Gosh, I hope these Clintons go away, get put in the ground soon. Um, there was another Clinton murder uh, just two weeks ago. <clears throat> Again, ready to testify before the Congress. Uh, that's a prescription for death by murder. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the United States is not ready for a gold standard. Now, this is a very important part point. Since we're not ready, and since if we do come up with the gold, we will lose it right away, we will not pursue the gold standard. What I'm pointing to now <clears throat> is a forecast, and it's coming into full view, of a dual universe. Now, you may recall some forecasts that I had from 2000. You know, 15, 16, 17, I would say the dollar's going to rise, rise, then rise some more, then vanish. Mm -hmm. I think you used to say it would <clears throat> shoot up like a firework into the air and then just vanish. Like explode like a firework. Is that what yeah. you used to say? Well, I didn't use that metaphor, but that's the same point. It would just vanish because of the destructive influence of having risen so much. Okay. When Okay, let me give you an example of some smaller countries. Turkey, Brazil, and the Dominican Republic. I know a good deal about Dominican Republic because I got a lady friend who comes from there, and, and I get little reports about you know food price rising. And I said, why the food price rising? She said, because the Dominican dollar has gone down thirty percent since two thousand fifteen. Right, because because that's a good point, Jim. Because when you're talking about the dollar rising, you're not talking about inflation. You're talking about the dollar getting stronger. Correct. I don't like to use the word stronger. I like to say the dollar's trading at a higher mark. Okay. Now, why would other countries like Turkey, Brazil, and Dominican Republic have their currency go down? It's not that they're weaker. The United States has the weakest economy perhaps in the entire world as far as fundamentals are concerned. Remember, I just cited the $920 billion trade deficit and a $1.2 trillion federal deficit. It's a $2 trillion deficit per year in total. Does any other nation have such numbers? <clears throat> Yet the dollar's rising. I don't say it's strengthening. I say it's rising. Okay. It's rising because we're able to print money and to support it. The Turks cannot. The Brazilians cannot. The Dominicans cannot. Therefore, their food prices are rising and we're wrecking their economies. Okay, so the United States is not prepared for a gold standard, and we're going to do our dead level best to ensure that the dollar continues okay. in trade usage and in banking usage for as many countries as we can manage to convince or coerce. Okay, now Jim, let me stop you right there. When you're talking about trying to continue it for as long as we can for as long as they can. Now, I'm looking at things going on, and it seems like every single month I'm seeing a crisis in the gold market. One month, Australia's missing 80 tons of gold. One month, we're hearing about, I don't know whose gold it was, ISIS gold in Syria, something about tons of gold stolen. Now we're hearing about Citigroup selling Venezuelan gold. My point is that every month there seems to be a crisis in the gold market. And every month I'm seeing China and Russia add to their numbers of gold. And are these the types of things that are happening? Because, as you say, it's just one of the ways that they can maintain this dollar for just a little while longer. We need to steal the gold in order to maintain the dollar. Okay. It is so simple. 
we need war in order to create the chaos, in order to, cre in order to create the conditions for stealing gold. <clears throat> we stole 110 tons of Iraqi gold. We stole 144 tons of Libyan gold. We stole 40 tons of Ukrainian gold. We stole 40 tons of Venezuelan gold. Yet we put out propaganda that gold is a dead asset. If it's so dead, why do we work so hard to steal it? That's right. And why are those numbers correlating, interestingly, curiously, with the amount that China and Russia are stacking every month? 40 tons of gold stolen from this country, Russia adds 40 tons of gold this month. These things are just kind of forming these <clears throat> pictures that are coming into focus that say the world is moving away from the dollar and there's not a lot of months left because every month there's a crisis, it seems to me. Is, I, is, I don't, is, is my logic there correct, Jim? No, your logic is good, but I, I don't follow the, uh, the the granular arguments like, oh gosh, Venezuela lost 40, but Russia's up 40. It, it, it's really not that simple. It's more like there's a lot of stolen gold everywhere in the West, and there's a lot of increases in the East. And, you know, in a, in a macro calculation on a napkin, yeah, they, they might match up pretty well, but <clears throat> the Russians... Okay, this is very important. In 2015, the Russians set up with China, might have been 2014, the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail energy deal. It was a $230 billion, 10 to 20 year uh, contract to buy Russian oil from Ch China buying Russian oil. Okay. <clears throat> Got confused with my buy there. It was a big contract set up by the two for China to buy Russian oil. Now, shortly after that was set up, China created the gold oil contract in Shanghai, futures contract. Russia's been using it. They sell China the oil, they receive RMB, they go straight to the Shanghai um, futures contract and they redeem with gold. Okay, it's an oil RMB contract and then they use that contract with the oil RM, I'm sorry, oil gold contract. <clears throat> now they completed the triangle. Okay. In March of last year, there's the Petro, the oil RMB contract. So now we have oil, gold, RMB in the triangle in Shanghai. Russia's been using it. And they buy, they buy gold from China in Shanghai from the oil purchases. Okay. Okay. This is new. What you can do, take a few steps back and say the East has now linked gold to the oil trade. That's big. That's very big. It's a dagger in the heart of the petrodollar. You know, Jim, people say, well, that's not big news. People can just go take their dollars and buy gold on the COMEX anytime they want. But everybody knows you can't do that. It is not that simple. There's no gold at the COMEX. They're not just taking their oil dollars and buying gold from New York or from London or from anywhere That's right. else. That's right. In fact, it's it's a little bit more insidious. If Let's just say there's a big hedge fund and they, they want to buy a ton of gold. Just okay. a simple number. Mm -hmm. They want to buy a ton of gold. And I don't know exactly what it's worth. I think it's something like $30 million. They want to buy a ton of gold, so they set up a futures contract. And they say, we want delivery. Let's say... They're doing it. They did it a couple months ago, and it's for a March delivery. They go to the COMEX and say, we got these contracts. We want to buy a, a ton of gold. And they say, sorry, you can't. you got to roll it over. That's the end of the game. That's it. They don't get the gold. They don't get to buy any gold. They don't have any gold in all in a truck delivery. They don't get a ton. They're forced to buy the June contract. And we're, hiking, and we're hiking your margin requirement, so if you can't pony up, then we're going to liquidate no, no, it. No, no, it's not, it's not like that at all. They had their margin requirement. They satisfied all the contractual obligations, and the comic said, F you, we're mm -hmm. not giving you any gold. You must comply by the rules, roll it over into the June contract, or we won't let you in the door anymore. <clears throat> okay, I want to... Okay, you, you mentioned a lot of the pilferage of, of gold. Uh, that is to sustain the gold market where they must, in London, come up with some gold or suffer a big default. I want to have one example. Okay. okay there's a group of nations, Austria, 
Netherlands, Germany. They form what the voice calls the nucleus of Central Europe. And he believes that they're going to stick together and boot out the, the southern broken uh, pigs nations of Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Because they're all indebted and they can't resolve their debt. They can't get out of the trade deficits. They can't get out of the, the government deficits. They're, they're in a bind just like the United States. If you want a list of similar countries to the United States for wretched fundamentals, look no further than Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, the broken pigs nations. Okay, Germany requested, this was around, I think it was around 2008, following Lehman, they immediately looked to retrieve and repatriate their gold from the New York Fed. It was something on the order of 200, 250 tons. And the United States actually showed disdain and disrespect for a parliamentary delegation from Germany who went, like, let's just think of a group of 10, 10 or 12 people. They went to the New York Fed and said, we want to see our gold, sign the papers, and get this process moving for repatriating our gold. The New York Fed did not even let them in the door. Mm. They were sent home packing. That's not a hedge fund, Jim. That's a sovereign nation. That's a powerhouse, Jim. I know. And, and it, it triggered a lot of events that followed. Okay, so how did the United States react to that? They're, they were left with a, like a 220, 250 million, uh, thousand tons I'm sorry, <laughs> 250 tons of gold. They were left with a request for 200 tons of gold, 250 tons. So how did they react? They started a war in Northwest Africa. They started a war in Chad. Okay. And then they announced that the West was going to be the beneficiary of 70 tons of gold per year from mines in Chad. And all you had to do was do the simple math. They said that uh, Germany would be repaid in, in six or five or, I don't know, a few years, multiplied by the stated output of Chad, and it equaled pretty much exactly the Russian repatriation request. The German repatriation request. I'm sorry, the German repatriation, sorry. <clears throat> that, that's uh, that's just in time inventory. That's a mad scramble just, to get just gold, Jim. Just inventory, yeah. Just in time war, war sack inventory. Okay, so this is how we're operating to satisfy requirement. I got one other story. This is very close to home, and this involved the Voice, it involved the uh, the Interpol, and it involves some very powerful people who put leverage on the London bankers in March of 2013. I'm sorry, March 2011. It ended in 13. Okay, March 2011, I got a phone call from The Voice, and he said, Jim, this is very, very big news. There's pressure put on the London bankers to provide 1,000 tons of gold per month, per month, for China. And I asked, what's the pressure? And they said, well, they've got the fraud division, special fraud division of Interpol involved. They've got a, a team of very powerful attorneys involved. And they've got documented fraud from the creation of the European Monetary Union that created and set up the euro currency. They misused, you can use the word stolen, I don't like that word, they used without authority Chinese gold to set up the entire euro currency illegally. Hmm. Hmm. And China called them on it and said, we want our tonnage back. 30 months later, they stopped. Okay, we're talking about March of 2011 until the end, around September or October of 2013, because I asked at the end, like December, Christmas time, 2013. I said, sir, please tell me, what's the status of this thousand per month? And he said, it ended. 
It ended at 30 months. And I said, what's the significance of 30,000? He said, that was just the agreed upon amount of tonnage. Okay, so... And, and Jim, people think, you know, my sources are telling me that China has north of 30,000 tons. People say, oh, no, th there's no way they can have that much gold. Jim, the United States used to have 20,000 tons of gold. You mean to tell me China can't have accumulated 30,000 tons? They're savers, right? They're not consumers. They're savers. They're investors in the yellow metal, Jim. Um, it's so much different from that. It's funny. Okay. Um, China, okay, this is just a little bit of history. Um, China has 5,000 years of history for royalty, for joining kingdoms. Um, China itself is a word that comes from Qin, Cheng, Chen, Chuang, Chuang, Sang. They're all variations of the word king. Okay. I had a friend named Cheng, <laughs> David Cheng. He was a friend of mine in 2003 and four, and he said, Jim, are you aware there are entire villages in China, where everybody has the name Cheng. <laughs> I said, no. No, I didn't know that. He said, are you aware that if you take the word, the name Cheng, with all the variations that I mentioned, plus a few more, because it, it Sang, Chang, Ch Chan, Charlie Chan, uh, the actor from Hong Kong, Chan, um, they're all variations of the, of the name King. And, and he said, can you guess, Jim? How many people in China, out of their total population, have a name that's a variation of this word for king? And I said, no. And he said, 350 million. Okay. <clears throat> China is an organization of kingdoms. These kingdoms have been around for 5,000 years. Okay. Now, we have, you know, these excavated um, armies made of, of carvings. You know, the, the old, they're, 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 they're museums right now. Uh, it, it's entire armies, like a, a thousand soldiers that are all sculptures. Mm -hmm. The terracotta warriors? or Yeah, all that. Mm -hmm. These are thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Chinese have been accumulating gold for thousands of years. Okay. Their kingdoms have been doing so for thousands of years. The name China comes from king. The kings all accumulated gold. The name China is also mainland China, and it's you know it's uh, the central kingdom. It's got a lot of different nicknames. They joined the kingdoms to become the main kingdom. They all joined their gold over thousands of years. I have estimates. The, vo the voices confirm this. I've heard it from several sources in addition. He said, Jim, the Chinese have somewhere between 110 and 120,000 tons of gold. That's four times my estimate, Jim. Yeah. Your estimate, <clears throat> okay, there have been a couple of analysts. Uh, uh, McLeod, Alistair McLeod, um, Manley, um, and a couple of other analysts have come up with I think, estimates. I think Bill Holter, possibly. There, there are a few. No, there's, there's several different analysts who have come up with legitimate, step-by-step, -step, systematic accumulation since the 1970s. Just since the 1970s, it's very credible that the Chinese have added 25 to 30,000 tons. Okay. Very credible. Um, let me give you a little side so, story. So our calculation is not taking into consideration this rich history that you're talking no, about. Not at all. Not at all. You're, you're, you're focusing with that story, which is a good story, a legitimate story. You're focusing on the, the, the last generation. Okay. I need to it, widen my horizon a little bit and think longer previous, term. Not the previous 500. Okay. So if they got 30,000 in the last generation, how much do you think they have in the last 500 generations? Okay. They have a lot. Um, they actually, you know, spread it out. The, the Manchu dynasty that Fulford talks about, there might have been a tremendous amount of gold uh, sequestered in the Swiss banks, for instance, for some of the Asian royalties that weren't China. 
Uh, Thailand is another uh, royalty setting with a tremendous amount of gold. No one talks about the gigantic Thailand uh, dynasty and gold reserves. Nobody talks about it. Well, maybe one or two, but it's never. I, I hardly ever hear about anything like that. Uh, we do hear about Indonesia being a, a nice hidey hole for a lot of stolen gold. Uh, you know, the Pacific Rim is perfect for hiding stuff. It, it's endless. It's got thousands of islands. I mean, we've got we have the Caribbean. <laughs> we have the Caribbean with a couple hundred islands. The Pacific Rim has maybe two thousand islands. <clears throat> the entire Philippines. It's called the Philippines because it's the Philippine Islands. Okay, I got a little side story for you. It's gold history. <clears throat> uh, and this is not told in the West, except maybe in the Hattrick Letter and a few other publications that are, seem to have their, their facts and figures correct and their heads screwed on. <clears throat> in 1999, everybody knows that Hong Kong was handed back to uh, the Chinese from the British. The 100-year colony contract ended. But they don't know the side deals. They just figured, oh, we hand it over, and wow, that's the end of it. No, that's the beginning of it. There were side deals. The West, just think the mass of multinational corporations, who some people say control the governments of U.S. and Britain, Great Britain, it's called the United Kingdom, <clears throat> um, and that's, that's largely true. Add in the central bankers, and they control the governments. Okay, so what was the deal? We handed over Hong Kong. It's hard to call it handed over. They retrieved their colony, <coughs> and we acquiesced with a contract. But we had requirements. We said to them, uh, we'll invest a lot in China and help China to reindustrialize, not reindustrialize, but industrialize, and uh, we'll promise you know, tens of billions in corporate business. Foreign direct investment. Think of it as CapEx, plant and equipment. Right. And we will be very generous in transfer of technology. Not completely generous. As you're seeing now, we're, we're fighting over Huawei and ZTE super chips. Okay. So we promised to have a big investment. Just in 2002 and three, it was $23 billion from the United States and Canada. Just two years, $23 billion. There was another deal. We said, the United States said, we want to lease 5,000 tons of gold. And China said, okay, but we're going to do some stipulation and some securitizing of that 5,000 tons. So they did. They created, uh, it's another IRS. Uh, it's an interest, okay, it's not the interest rate swap derivative, but it's an IRS macro secure stream bond. Okay, what you do, just think of <clears throat> your mortgages. I'm going to go from micro to macro. Micro level, you got a, a group of 100 mortgages. You put them together, you got a secure stream of, of payments each month. Of course, there are little default rates, whatever, but you've got the secure stream of 100 mortgages. You create a bond on it. It's called a mortgage bond, and it's called secure stream mortgage bond. Okay, that's the micro example. That was full of fraud in 2003, 4, 5, and 6, and that all blew up with Lehman. Okay, aside from that, we created an IRS macro secure stream bond, and that securitized and collateralized the gold lease from China of 5,000 tons. And we reneged on it. Okay. We defaulted. And in 05, the Chinese said, you've defaulted. The United States said, yeah, F you. What are you going to do? <laughs> So in 2006, China announced, we are going to focus on our United U.S. dollar-based bonds in our Forex account. We are going to focus on treasuries. United States defaulted on the bond. And the Chinese said, we're going to focus on treasury bonds in our Forex holdings of dollar-based assets. I read between the lines, I talked to a few smart people, and then I read the confirmation. The Chinese are selling Fannie Mae bonds. That was 06. Can you think of an event 
that happened in 07 and 08 that might have been a climax to that lit fuse. Right, right. The Chinese started the explosion of the subprime mortgage bonds. Okay. Okay, so they announced they were going to focus on holding just treasuries. Therefore, the mathematician says, what are you dumping? It's the mortgage bonds. Okay, now, move forward to 2012. After QE, you know, the hypermonetary inflation of, un of uh, unsterilized type, Gosh, that's a mouthful. Unsterilized. In other words, we're going to print money, cover U.S. government debt, and not draw funds elsewhere from the banking industry. That's what Africa did with a bad result. That's what South America did with a bad result. But we're doing it because we're the exceptional nation. And now we call it MMT, modern monetary theory. Right. And, and wrap all, it in a bow. And it's all blowing up. Okay, but I'm pointing to 2012. Something okay. happened. Okay. We, launched, okay. we launched QE. <clears throat> then we had QE two and a half or QE light. Bernanke announced that China was going to be converting their long-term treasuries to short-term treasuries. Okay. That was QE. Some call it QE light. Some call it two E Q and a half. What was that all about? Okay. First, the Chinese were reneged upon. Then they announced on the gold lease, 5,000 tons or so. Then they announced, indirectly, they announced they're dumping Fannie Mae treasuries, uh, Fannie Mae bonds, and that resulted in the explosion at Lehman, which is a whole story in itself. I'll just call it the Lehman event. And then the Chinese further reduce, they're going to go just to short-term treasuries. And now we're told they hold a trillion dollars worth of short-term treasuries, even though they're short-term. What does short term mean? Five years, two years, one year, and less. And we're told, well, they're waiting for the duration, the maturation of those bonds. When are they going to mature? Never. They're short term. Are they going to mature? Well, all the two years did. When they did this in 2012, they might have completed the process in 2013 or 14. We've had four years since. How come their treasuries still show a trillion? Hmm. Did they not mature as we were told they would mature? Or was it all bullshit in the accounting? I maintain the Chinese are very low in their treasury holdings. They've got lots of deals like, oh gosh, they, 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 they front $10 billion to Angola government to help them with their debt, their government debt. And they're redeemed with $10 billion worth of RMB in the course of the year from oil sales. They do a big base and, uh, what do you call it, port facility, military base in Djibouti. It costs a couple of cool billion. They do all these different things in Kenya, in Rwanda. They're doing all kinds of things. They're doing community centers in Nigeria. They're doing all kinds of things. They're spending their money yet they're still holding a trillion dollars. I think they're stuck on a trillion with the, with the agreement that the accounting will always show a trillion. I think they've done swaps for whatever they've got left. I'll go out on a limb and say they're nearly net zero U.S. dollars. They already moved to short term in 2012 and 13. We, we analyze and say, well, they're going to allow maturity of their bonds and not renew, not, what do you call it? roll it over did they or did they not and you know we hear all these stories okay they bought another 20 billion last month in treasury bond. yeah okay fine i think they are buying some but i think they're redeeming it in gold and they're not telling us about it and that's part of the agreement they might they might actually have some treasury bonds from recent purchases the the best way to keep the game going and to keep the available gold uh, on the ramps to ship to China is to continue by treasury. So I'm a bit contradictory here. I think there's a big effort in the last several years to reduce their, their liability for treasuries and dollar-based bonds. But at the same time, there's also an initiative to continue the game and continue to buy more treasuries. But are they not converting the treasuries to commercial office buildings in the United States? Mm -hmm. They own one-third of all the commercial buildings in something like 20 or 30 major U.S. cities. 
They're doing the same in London. They're doing the same in Europe. They're doing the same in Japan. Not maybe not Japan. In in uh, the Pacific Rim. Okay. So they're investing. I, I maintain they don't have a trillion dollars in treasuries. Okay, fine. Jim, they've Jim. taken their bonds, they've taken their dollars, and they've converted them into real things, real estate, gold. And this is a lot of dollars that are swirling around in the world. If they're buying commercial office property in the United States, if they're making direct investments in various African nations, there are a lot of storm clouds forming with a whole lot of dollars that are about to rain down on the United States, Jim. Well, more like rain down on the treasury bond market, but maybe not necessarily on the the, uh, the United States. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm 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 just you know picking at words here. Don't leave out the ports that in Greece that that the Chinese bought, and they just made a new memorum, memorandum of understanding to buy Italian ports. So this is American investment, European investment, African investment, Jim. What do you say to the people, when I talk to people that don't really understand money and I talk about the fact that our money's not backed by gold and silver anymore and all fiat currencies die, I inevitably get that's never going to happen to the dollar. It's already happening to the dollar. That's what I'm hearing you say right now, Jim. Can you explain what this means for people who bust their ass to earn dollars that every month don't even stretch as far. What is coming to these people, Jim? Okay. U.S. citizens are treated to probably the worst, the most biased and tilted mainstream news in the entire industrialized world of 20 nations. You can go to Finland and get better quality news. You can go to Luxembourg. You can go to Portugal and get better quality news. It's incredibly controlled and tilted. When I talk to tourists, I, you know, this is a, a strange thing to say, but several years ago, I turned sour on the Americans in Costa Rica. I got swindled by a couple, one was a friend of mine. I concluded that out of 10 Americans, eight are pretty much worthless. They're drunks, they're dumb, uh, they come here to, I don't know, the, the skin trade. They, they come here to, to defraud people. Um, they come here as confidential informants after getting into tax trouble in the United States. I know two of them. Um, so I decided to stay away from them. I have, I have two or three American friends. I have a, a couple of Canadian friends, one in particular. I stay away from Americans, but I... I I still sample opinions from Americans. At a sports bar, like last night, watching the Michigan game. Wow, what a surprise. What, 16, 18 first half points? Are you kidding me? So I, I got into a conversation with a guy who was watching the game. I could have asked him, but that's a typical sort of person that I ask. In the past, not this guy, I, I, got I get tired of that. I, I didn't even want to bother asking him about dollar. I wanted to watch the game. I wanted to have a drink. I don't drink alcohol. I had a, you know, a juice drink. <laughs> they got great juices here in Costa Rica. All right, so my point is that I've sampled probably 50 opinions in the last few years. I asked them, what do you think's happening with the dollar? I said, the dollar's strong, man. I mean, we rule, man. We rule. We rule. We rule. I said, yeah, are you drunk? No, no. I only had a couple beers. What do you mean we rule? Oh, the dollar's accepted everywhere. I said, Oh, really? Why are they dumping them in Russia? Oh, fuck Russia. Yeah, okay, right. Why are they dumping them in China? Oh, no, China's like, we own China, man. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We buy all their shit. Okay, you know, I talk with dumb Americans. The majority are dumb. I asked them, are you aware of the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB? That was three years ago. No, what's that? I said, oh, it's, I don't know, it's about 40 nations. Uh, looking to uh, industrialize and set up bridges and railroads and port facilities and infrastructure. What's infrastructure? <clears throat> and, and they're doing it without using the dollar. In the last two years, I asked, are you, are you familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative? No, what's that? What? I don't deal with fashion. You know, what are you talking about? 
No, it's not a belt. It, it's the Chinese and their multi-trillion dollar uh, infrastructure projects that have something like 100 nations sign. Oh, I don't know about that. I said, then why do you think the dollar rules? Because it's accepted everywhere and it's strong, man, it's strong. Look, I buy more in Costa Rica now than I did two years ago. I said, yeah, it has a higher exchange rate. Does that mean it's strong? And he said, well, obviously, yeah. What's your problem? I said, well, I don't know. I'm just a dumb economist. <clears throat> okay, so I haven't encountered any Americans who know about the non-dollar platforms. I haven't encountered any Americans who understand the Chinese have drawn down by 50% their U.S. dollar holdings, Forex holdings. I haven't encountered any Americans who know what Forex foreign holdings are. I haven't encountered any Americans who understand that the dollar and treasury bonds serve as the basis and foundation of foreign banking systems. I haven't encountered any Americans who understand that the treasury bills are used in trade payment and that's changing. I haven't encountered any Americans who know jack shit. That's I, my point. I, I have an analogy for that. And it's walking down the street, whistling, <clears throat> enjoying the weather. Nowadays, you're just turned down and texting on the phone. And then, bam, getting smacked on the side of the head with a 2 by 4 That's what's coming to these people, Jim. They're going to get run over by a truck when they're crossing the street doing text messages.